today's presentation. Today is our very last uh, seminar of the year. So thanks for, for coming, for the people that has been um, follow our seminar through internet and people that comes to the, to the auditorium as well. I want to just take two minutes to thanks to the other uh, co-coordinators of this seminar. Uh, maybe you don't see, usually you just see me here speaking, but we have other two coordinators. One is a limit, limit, turn on your camera a moment and say hello to people. <laughs> yeah, uh, Limini is the one in charge of all the technological and Zoom, so Limini is working very hard. And our other coordinate is is Colin. Colin, can you turn on your camera for a moment and say hello to people? Hi, everyone. That's Colin. Colin is the one who tried to do all the schedule and all the agenda, he really sometimes has to go in a rush trying to get the great presenters that comes to, to our seminars. So, and we have a, a four member of this team, which is Vivian. Vivian is not here. She's not a, a, a graduate seminar of our center, but she's doing his PhD, her PhD, uh, doing an excellent job uh, and with all the logistics that is behind the, the seminar. So yeah, we are the team that prepared the seminar. We are so happy and thanks all for being here. And today, just to close all these seminars, we have a presentation about pile load testing of a concrete belt pile and rock socket, a pile using the Osterberg low cell. So I will do a little introduction of this presentation. Uh, during construction of the Northwest Anthony Henday Drive, alternatives to optimize pile foundations for the bridge structure were desired. This stretch includes 21 kilometers of row rail and 29 structure. Half of the bridges structure were designed when driving steel piles and half utilized ca ca casting place concrete piles. Pile load tests permit the bridges designers to adopt a higher resistance factor, which translates into a more cost-effective foundation. This presentation discusses case histories for pile load tests on concrete belt and concrete rope socket piles that were implemented at two sites. Both pile load tests in comport in comport the use of an Osterberg low cell. And um, for today's seminar, we have with us uh, Mr. Tony Ruban. Uh, Mr. Ruban is a principal consultant with Tetra Tech, specialized in geotechnical engineering. He has over 40 years of experience in geotechnical engineering on variety of projects throughout Western Canada. His areas of expertise include foundation, slope stability, groundwater seepage, and water retaining structure. Mr. Ruban has been, uh, has been involved with numerous investigations for a wide variety of projects, including industrial development, road weights, high weights embankments, cut slopes, bridges, subdivision development, excavation, calling ponds, water reservoirs, sewage lagoons, tailing dam, wasting dams, and pipeline river crossing. In the past decade, he has been involved in numerous pile load testing that has been successfully used to optimize pile foundations. So two notes before the beginning of the presentation. Note number one is that our speaker is okay. If you have any questions, just raise your hand during the presentation and you can do the, the question at the moment if you want. Otherwise, you can uh, wait at, until the end. And a second question, please all the graduate seminars stay uh, after the end of the presentation because we have information about the retaining wall competition. So with that, please join me welcoming Mr. Rapid. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, 
couple of a, a quick notes. Uh, anybody here ever been involved in a pilot test? Um, yeah, typically the, the your conventional pilot load test is is what we call a top down test. Uh, this this particular uh, technique is a little bit different in that it actually uses the the cell that's that applies the load uh, to actually get embedded into the pile itself. So this is a, a presentation of a, a case history uh, for two sites that we worked on back in two thousand and eight. Um, it was also it's also written up in a in a Canadian technical conference, and I'll provide that reference later on if anybody ever wants to uh, to have a look at it. So, um, just a quick review: the typically the type, kind of pile load tests that you you generally see are uh, uh, static, which is conventional pile load test, and what we call the Osterberg. Uh, cell test, which, and I'll use the terminology O cell just for an abbreviation. You also have uh, dynamic uh, testing, which includes PDA and statinamic, but that isn't uh, anything that I'm going to be discussing. It'll be the, the O cell uh, particular. So, just a quick summary of what's involved in a conventional pile load test. Uh, originally, when we uh, did pile load tests before the advent of limit states design, you would typically conduct what's called a standard or a maintained test and then that uh, test the pile will be loaded up in 25 percent of the design load up to a 200 percent of its uh, anticipated design and then uh, held for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours uh, with limit states design there has been uh, a change to the uh, the STM standard, and now the, the test method that's that's most commonly used is called the quick test. Uh, the difference in that test is that they typically ink, uh, apply the load in 5% increments of the estimated ultimate capacity, so that's 20 steps typically, unless it fails before that, and you typically hold it from anywhere from 8 to 15 minutes. Uh, one of the big advantages is that this, this type of test is completed in four to six hours, which uh, it's a huge saving rather than have to sit around uh, for 24 hours waiting to see that the, uh, the test perform properly. The other difference is that typically these tests are taken, the pile is taken to failure, where the, the, uh, the former testing standard in a lot of cases would just take it to a, a twice the design. And a lot of cases you didn't know just how much more capacity you actually had in the pile. So this is just a, a quick schematic. Of, of a typical load test. Uh, you start with, uh, in this case here, it's it's a schematic of, of a pile group, but in, more, uh, in most instances, you're just testing a single pile. And again, this is a conventional load test. It's not the Osterberg. It involves a hydraulic jack. You also have a load cell. Uh, you typically would have some hemispherical plates to make sure that the load being applied is being applied Axially, and there is no eccentricity being applied to the pile itself. Typically, you'd have steer bit, steel bearing plates uh, that transfer the load up to the main reaction beam itself, which is the big beam running uh, across the page here. Um, and you also have anchor piles to hold, uh, to provide the resistance because you're pushing down on the pile. And in order to do that, you need to have uh, a reaction force. And typically you have a, a load transfer beam on the, at, at the edges uh, to provide uh, transferring the load from the test pile to the reaction beam and into the anchor piles. So this is a, a, a photo and hopefully that's come, okay, it's not too bad. So this is our main reaction beam here. Uh, these are our transfer beams. The anchor piles are, are down in here. They're kind of buried underneath these uh, this timber cribbing. And this is the, uh, the, the, the assembly of the, the jack itself. And as shown on the previous slide, you've got the jack here. You also have your steel plates. Here we have a, a load cell. Uh, and on the bottom here, you'll see these are a couple of reference beams, and we need those in order to take our dial gauge readings. And here's a here's an LD some LDDTs and dial gauges that are being applied 
that are used to, uh, to monitor deformations. Now the Osterberg cell uh, test by comparison, as mentioned before, uh, on the schematic here on the right, you'll see that uh, you've got a reaction beam here and you're pushing from the top down, as I mentioned. In the, in the O-cell test, what we do is you typically embed the, uh, the O-cell someplace deep in the pile, not necessarily right at the tip, but close to the tip. And then you're pushing up. So what happens is the cell physically expands and you're pushing up and you're pushing down. So um, generally you tend to find that these are most commonly used in cast in place concrete piles, but they can also be used for driven steel or helical and pre-stressed pre concrete piles as well. One of the big advantages is in the, uh, in the previous photo that I uh, presented, with a conventional load test, you're typically limited with the amount of uh, axial load that you can apply to the test pile itself. And that's largely because of the reaction beam that you need. Uh, if you recall in that the previous photo, the, the main reaction beam, they're, they're pretty beefy. They're typically three or four feet high. Uh, and, and that would typically be used for uh, maybe a five mega Newton load, uh, maximum axial load. Uh, We've, we've done some load tests where we've uh, tripled up that main reaction beam and gotten as much as uh, 18 uh, mega newtons in terms of capacity. But one of the big advantages with the O-cell is that it allows you to test some really high loads uh, and they're up, they've, they've done loads up to 200 mega newtons and higher. So that makes a huge, uh, it gives a big advantage because when you get up to the really high loads, if you've got a very large pile that you're testing, you physically can't do it with a conventional uh, top-down load test. As I mentioned, uh, one of the other things that we do is we'll always instrument the pile, not only with the O-cell, but also with strain gauges along the shaft, and that'll allow us to determine the shaft friction. Uh, and the O-cell utilizes a, a, a automated data system for, uh, for collecting the data during the test itself. So just quickly, uh, an overview about the project. Northwest uh, Anthony Hende, at the time when this load test was, uh, when these load tests were constructed, Northwest Anthony Hende was just being built. Uh, it's a perimeter road around uh, Edmonton. It started in 2008 and opened in the fall of 2011. It includes 21 kilometers of road and 21 different bridge structures. Half of the structures were designed with driven steel piles and the other half were designed with, cat, with various cast in place concrete piles. Total cost of the project back then was $1.4 billion. So here's a schematic of the uh, of, of Northwest at the Hende. We start at the West End here uh, at the Yellowhead Trail, goes around the North End and it matches up with Manning Drive or Highway 15. Our, the two sites, where we did our pile load tests. One was at 127th Street and the other one was at uh, Campbell Road intersection. So uh, why do we do pile load tests? Uh, and we typically do it to what we call optimized pile foundations. But at the end of the day, what, what does that really mean? It really means that you can save the owner money. Okay, Concrete uh, pile load tests typically run you 100,000 as a starting and they could go up to 200,000. So the question you got to ask yourself is, you know, if I'm making this investment of 100,000 up front, you know, how much am I going to save? Because by optimizing the pile foundations, you can make it more economical, which means you can either make them smaller in diameter or shorter in length or fewer number of them. And that combination ends up resulting in cost savings. So really the, the big impetus behind doing a lot of these pile load tests is uh, is saving money. And on this particular project, it was a P3 project. And when you tell the contractor that he has to spend $100,000 to do a load test, you have to do an awful lot of convincing to get him to, to buy in that, you know, you got to save, you got to spend a little up front, but the intent is the big money for any kind of construction is always in the construction side. On the design side, by comparison, it's peanuts. 90% of the money gets spent in construction. So if I can save, if I can save the money in a lot of cases, for instance, 
foundations for a typical building will run somewhere in the order of a million bucks. So if I could spend a hundred thousand, and at the end of the day, I only spend seven hundred fifty thousand on the foundations, I'm one hundred fifty thousand further ahead. So really, it's it's the whole monetary side of it that drives uh, a lot of the pile load testing that's done, and it certainly was what was required here because uh, you could never get a contractor to part with hundred thousand. Uh, unless there was some way that he had, they were looking for literally guarantees that they'd be saving money. So, uh, but the big advantage is when you do a pile load test, if, you, if you're not doing a pile load test, limit states design requires you to use a, a soil resistance factor of 0.4. But if I do the pile load test, I can now use a resistance factor of 0.6. So I've got literally a 50% bump in the parameters. So if I got a skin friction value of, an ultimate of 100 kPa, for instance, and using conventional design, I'd only be able to utilize uh, a shaft friction value of 40. But with the pile load test, the code allows you to uh, to use the 60 kPa, for instance. So that's just a kind of an example. The other thing is typically when you're doing it, especially if you're doing with some kind of instrumentation, you also obtain a more realistic value for your shaft friction and embering. A lot of cases, we do all the theoretical calculations, but when you ask yourself in reality, how well do I really know whether I'm mobilizing, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 KPA in that shaft? Um, theory tells me one thing, but then there's, there's the practical side. And the beauty of doing the pile load test is it certainly helps us as designers. Uh, give us a lot more confidence in the values and in our methods uh, for for determining what we what we provide for parameters. So one of the sites um, that were selected was uh, was designed with with belt piles and clay tail, and the other site was uh, we were looking at using rock sockets in the bedrock for the for the bridge structure. So we'll look at the uh, the belt pile load test first, which is the one conducted at 127th Street. Um, belt piles are are a very common foundation type that that are utilized in the Edmonton area. They've been used for 60 years, 70 years. They've been used a long time, and uh, they're they're a very economical uh, foundation type. But uh, you know, prior to 2008, when we did this work, there were very few uh, load tests that were actually ever carried out on belt piles. So all the parameters that were typically given were based on theory uh, with very little, uh, very little practical confirmation of the values that were actually used in the design. Uh, this part of the world that we live in is, uh, is very conducive to cast in place concrete piles and the local piling contractors have many decades of experience with, with board piles. So it's, it's a very successful, and it tends to be the most economical pile type, um, largely because of cost. So this load test uh, that we performed was conducted in December of 2008. Although that was a long time ago, I mean, all the, all the information is still valid. So the stratigraphy at the site comprised uh, Lacoste and Silton clay in the upper 10 meters. That was underlain by a glacial till uh, from 10 to 22 meters. Blow counts typically in the 20 to 24 range. And we had Cretaceous bedrock, which is clay shale and sandstone uh, beyond 22 meters. Uh, the test pile was uh, 914 millimeter diameter with an 1800 millimeter bell. And the test pile length was 18 meters. Now, what was important there is what you have to be very critical of is knowing exactly where to put your O cell. Because what becomes very important is the fact that if I, depending on where I put the O cell, uh, the, the jack pushes up and down. And so what it's looking for is a uniform resistance. And if you set the O cell too high, then what will happen is you'll you mobilize the shaft friction and you won't fully fully won't fully mobilize the, the end bearing below the, the O cell or vice versa if you set it too low. So there's a bit of a balancing act. In this particular instance, we we did our best estimate with regards to exactly where uh, the pile length. We could have made a shorter pile length, but the problem is 
had we shortened the pile because our uh, our till was shallower, so we certainly could have looked at a, a 15 meter long pile, bell pile, for instance. However, had we done that, we would have fully mobilized the shaft and not fully mobilized the end bearing. And I'll get into that a little bit more. So that's one of the one of the tricks about putting in when you're utilizing this kind of, kind of technology. So here's a schematic um, of the uh, of the site, and so we've got clay and silt here down to about 10 meters and then clay till below that. And as I mentioned, shaft diameter for the test pile was 914 millimeters, a bell of 1800, the pile length was 18 millimeter, 18 meters. And we had five levels of, of strain gauges in the pile. And you'll notice that we were sort of picking locations uh, at stratigraphic boundaries when we were uh, putting in these, uh, these strain gauges. And at the, uh, the O-cell uh, location was, was placed at the top of the bell. And again, so we had we kind of played around with that a little bit to, to determine, okay, how long do I have to make the pile uh, or how short do we make the pile to try and balance what I'm gonna mobilize here in shaft friction above versus what I'm gonna get for capacity in my bell below. So for those of you who aren't familiar with, uh, with bell piles, that's a belling tool and that's what gets attached to the Kelly bar and actually forms the bell in the soil. Uh, one thing to note that these, uh, this type of uh, foundation is only good in cohesive soils because if you don't have clay or possibly a weak bedrock, you, uh, you know, in sandy soils, this doesn't work. So this is a picture of the uh, the O cell itself. Um, so the O cell is in in blue here. So we have a, a top plate, sorry, a bottom plate here, and then a top plate on this side. And uh, so when the when the cell actually starts to mobilize, it'll actually push up. So the up top plate pushes up, the bottom plate pushes down. And uh, you, you'll notice here this is uh, an LVDT that we've got installed. And that'll measure the separation between the top and the bottom plate. Uh, you also notice there are some steel black pipes here. There's one there, there's one there. There's also two on the other side. One here and one here. And uh, you can see that this, uh, this, this is a, a one inch diameter steel hollow pipe. And inside of that is a, is, is a threaded one quarter inch diameter uh, metal rod. And these extend all the way down to uh, the bottom plate and the, this other one is stops on the top plate. Uh, it's in behind the welding here. Uh, and what we, what's required is that we have to be able to get that information from how much those plates move up or down. And we have to measure that at the surface. And remember, this is buried like 17 meters below grade. So this is a view of, the, uh, of that assembly uh, from the bottom looking up, you can see we have some some uh, C channels here, and this is just a, a load frame, so it doesn't serve any purpose other than it needs to be. We need to be able to pick this O cell up, and we need to be able to drop it into the pile. So uh, this is a metal frame that's in it, uh, that we use to to be to enable to to hold on to and and accurately locate where the O cell is being placed. It also allows for uh, for putting in all the instrumentation that's required. So that's a shot of one of the uh, strain gauges that was installed. As I mentioned, there were five sets of strain gauges uh, and they typically are installed in pairs, one on other side, all the way up. This is a view of the, uh, of the assembly from the top, uh, looking from the top. So you can see all the wires from the strain gauges and the LVDTs that we've got, they all get bundled up at the top of the of the, the load carrying frame. Here we are just getting ready to lift it up into place. Uh, here it is getting ready to lower the pile into the hole. So they're just standing it up on the on, on the ground here and you can see roughly where the where the O cell is relative to the uh, to the bottom of the, the load frame. Here they're getting ready to, to lower the, uh, the O cell. You'll notice, for instance, here that uh, there's a cutout in the, in the plate, in the top and the bottom plates. Uh, 
And the reason for that is when they when they concrete the pile, they have to, uh, we always concrete using a tremie technique. So we need to be able to get a concrete pipe all the way to the bottom and that'll show up in the next couple slides. So here's the, uh, here's the uh, tremie pipe that they've uh, got ready and they're just trying to locate it and get it. So it gets a little tricky because you've got those, the cutouts in the steel plates and they're trying to, trying to thread that, that uh, tremie pipe uh, through through the threads to get it to the bottom of the pile. Here's another shot of that, looking from the top down. So our tremie pipe is in the background here, and there's our load frame on either side, and the uh, the pipes coming up from the from the bottom of the EO cell assembly itself. Here we're uh, filling up the uh, the casing with concrete, and again it's tremied, so uh, the concrete's coming in from the from the bottom up. So in the event that there's any water that gets pushed to the surface, another shot kind of showing the uh, us pulling up the, the concrete pipe. And they've removed the concrete pipe here. This is what they're kind of left with at the end. In this instance here, you can see there's water at the surface and they put a little bit more concrete on top just to top it off and then they clean it up. Uh, on the top here, all the uh, all the bundled wires that we had, they typically just wrap them up in a plastic bag and they use duct tape just to, to keep them from getting uh, destroyed with all the, the concrete. So that's a view of what it looks like once it's cleaned up and all the all the all the wire all the strain gauges uh, are hooked up to a data logger and I'll get into some more description of that later on. So this is the result from the uh, from the open cell test. Um, so what we're looking at here, if you can imagine, you start off initially here and the load gets gradually applied and uh, the bottom plate moves in this direction. So this is measuring the, the, uh, the bearing resistance that we've got going down. And this is our shaft friction. And uh, the, the, uh, we also have the return when we unloaded them, these this is what happened with our. So we you loaded it up initially, coming up this way, and uh, in bearing, this is what we got for shape of a deformation curve. And in shaft friction, you can see that there's a, a lot less movement in shaft friction than there is in end bearing, right? I mean, it's huge. We and here we picked up roughly 20 millimeters versus what 150. So this is a result from the strain gauges and it shows you what sort of shaft frictions we were mobilizing in the clay and in the till. Uh, so this is kind of a summary of what we were able to get from the information uh, on, on the shaft friction at least. And you can see the clay was typically giving us somewhere in the order of 30 to 40 kPa. We had that silt layer that was giving us a shaft friction of about 60. The till was anywhere from 55 up to 120. As I mentioned, the, the, the maximum upward move, uh, load was what, about three mega newtons and the movement was 19 millimeters. So this is the, uh, this is a, a plot illustrating the end bearing that was being mobilized uh, versus the, uh, the movement in terms of deformation and just how much movement you need to actually mobilize the bearing resistance. So we pay, we uh, got about 145 millimeters of deformation. And at that point we were mobilizing close to 1300 kPa in end bearing. So one of the limitations with the jacks, is it's got about six inches of stroke. So um, if we had a little, little bit more stroke, we could have pushed this. You can see for instance that our end bearing wasn't fully mobilized, but you can see just how much movement it takes to actually mobilize the end bearing. Like there's an awful lot, right? So that's something to, to kind of keep in mind and it's good to know. Uh, so looking at the, uh, the information from the, uh, from the movement on the, on the lower plate of the cell, which gives us our end bearing resistance, we, uh, we achieve about 3.3 mega newtons. As I mentioned, the ultimate end bearing is 1287 kPa. Uh, combining the shaft, and the end bearing, we got a, a total ultimate resistance of 6.5 mega newtons. Uh, 
And if you're using a resistance factor of 0.6, that gives you a factored resistance of about 3.9 mega newtons uh, for the pile itself. So this is what the uh, a plot of, of uh, displacement here, a load, typical load displacement curve. Uh, this is our load in this direction, displacement on the vertical axis. Uh, this is what our bearing resistance looked like for end bearing, and you can see the shaft resistance. And again, the dramatically different shape on on the shaft on, on the shaft friction in terms of how little movement it requires to mobilize shaft versus how much movement and it takes to mobilize end bearing. And this dark line is a is a plot of the uh, calculated resistance from both. The, it's just a summation of the of the shaft friction and the end bearing. So this is just a zoom into the upper part of that same plot that we saw on the previous figure. And as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the ultimate capacity of that pile was 6.5 mega newtons. And if you use a resistance factor 0.6 at 3.9 mega newtons, we're seeing about nine millimeters of movement. And normally you don't load the pile oh, yeah. to the maximum ultimate capacity. Uh, you typically only take it up to uh, the, the load that, that the pile actually sees is typically what we call a serviceability limit. And that's about 35% less than, than what the actual factor resistance is. And that's typically the kind of design load that the pile will actually be subjected to. Yeah, so that's, so five millimeters is what you're picking up in terms of, so that's the kind of settlement that you can expect from the belt pile. So it's, this is really useful because now we've got an appreciation and understanding of just how much sediment we'll expect. Our okay. Uh, I'm going to flip over to the Campbell Road site, which is where we did the uh, the rock socket uh, load test. Uh, the stratigraphy there was uh, lacustre and silts and clay in the upper seven meters. Blow counts typically in the, the five to ten uh, blows range. That was underlain by glacial till to about ten and a half meters. Blow counts in there were about twenty. And below that, we got into our bedrock. The upper uh, nine and a half meters of the bedrock was what we consider uh, weathered bedrock. Blow counts in the forty to eighty mil uh, blow range. And below 20 meters, we got into what, what we consider as relatively competent bedrock. And we define that as where you get a blow counts over 100. The, uh, the test pile was a 914 diameter and the length was 21 meters. And we did the load test in December 2008. Again, schematic of the, uh, the test pile that was installed. Uh, we pre-drilled down and that was in order to put in the casing and we typically, you typically get uh, pre-drilled down to about a meter or so into the bedrock. Uh, installed a temporary casing diameter of uh, 965 millimeters and then below that uh, we used a 910 millimeter diameter in the bedrock itself. File length was 21 meters roughly. And we uh, utilized seven levels of strain gauges. There were six above the O cell and one below the O cell. And the O cell was installed at 18.9 meters. And again, that, it gets tricky here because you got to try and figure out again, where do I put the O cell? So that's one of the, one of the, one of the real challenging parts of this is knowing exactly where to put it. Because again, if you put it too high, you mobilize the, the shaft and you don't fully mobilize anything below the O-cell. If you put it too low, the vice versa happens. So uh, something else that was done on, on this, uh, on, on the rock socket pile was we used the sonic caliper and that's a device to, just to measure just how vertical the, uh, the, the pile was. And you can see the, the red lines are the idealized uh, sidewalls of the pile, one's in the north-south direction, the other's in the east-west, and, the, and the, the black lines denote the, the sides of the pile uh, in terms of where it was relative to where it should have been in an idealized situation. We never deal in a perfect world. So you can see our pile here is a, it's a couple inches off center at the bottom. And here's a, here's a schematic just sort of illustrating 
roughly where the, uh, so at, at the bottom of the pile, you can see that uh, that's where the center of the pile should have been, but that's where it actually was. So in this instance, the pile itself was probably about four, four inches off center at the bottom relative to the top of the pile. So this is the uh, this is a tent enclosure that we had over top of all the equipment that was utilized for the load test. And I'll get back to this, so just kind of keep that picture in mind. Uh, so this is uh, this is what it looks like inside the uh, inside the tent enclosure with uh, all the equipment that's hooked up. Uh, there's the uh, there's all the paraphernalia that you need at the top of the pile. So it does, it, it's, it's a relatively complicated process. Um, it's just another setup looking in the other corner. So these are uh, high precision laser levels that were used. Um, and they were shooting on this particular bar graph. And uh, that chart gave us, allowed them to, to be able to pick up an accuracy of uh, one one hundredth of a millimeter. So it, it's pretty cool from, from my perspective, at least. Uh, that's one of the LVDTs that we had that was utilized, as I said, in the, the previous uh, photos. Uh, the, they had, we had uh, quarter inch diameter rods coming all the way to the surface. And in order to measure where the, where the top plates were going, in terms of whether they were going down or whether the plate was going up and just how much it was actually deflecting. The way you apply low to the, uh, to the to the test pilots to the to the cell they use what they call an air over water system so water is relatively incompressible um, so the uh, all the hoses that they have leading down to to the o cell itself in order to inflate it is uh, they're filled with water but in order to provide that they actually have a, they typically have a huge compressor and that compressor applies the pressure that's then transferred. So it's 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 a relatively complex system. You can see this isn't simple by any stretch of imagination. Uh, the data itself is collected on a data logger and it's fed to a laptop and you can watch all the results on the screen during the test itself. So here again is a this is a, a plot of our uh, of our results from the uh, from the rock socket load test. And again, the load starts here and you can see the this is what happened with the bottom plate. And you can see at one point here, we actually had to stop and do an unload. And that had to do with the shelter that I talked about earlier. And, uh, and then we were able to continue the test and, and take it to completion. Uh, again, the shaft friction is denoted by the red line. It goes up and you can see again that the amount of movement that we had in the shaft is considerably less than what we were picking up in Ender. These are some of the, uh, the strength parameters we were able to determine uh, from the strain gauges. Our, our uh, upper silt and clay was giving us values in the order of 40 to 48 kPa, the till was 82, and the bedrock was generally 100 to 150 in that range. This is a uh, the inferred end bearing resistance that we got from the plate. If you remember that the O-cell itself was actually slightly above the bottom. So you have to actually deduct the amount of shaft friction from the portion of the pile below the plate before you could act, interpret what how much load was actually getting transferred to the end bearing. Again, this is a plot of displacement versus, uh, in this case, we've converted into end bearing itself. And at the end of the load test, we were mobilizing somewhere near 6,000 kPa and bearing in the bedrock. So summary of our rock socket load test, we had an end bearing resistance just over four mega newtons, ultimate end bearing of about 6,000. Combined shaft friction and end bearing was uh, just over 10 mega newtons with a resistance factor of 0.6, you come up with a factor geotechnical resistance of the pile is 6.2 mega newtons. And again, this is a similar curve uh, or a plot showing our uh, load displacements. Uh, and here's the base resistance and here's our shaft resistance. And again, you can see how quickly the, the you, you develop shaft resistance where it takes a long time to, to pick up the base resistance by comparison. So 
It takes a lot of deformation to mobilize that end bearing where it takes very little in the uh, in, in shaft friction. Again, this is a zoom in on the upper part of that plot. Uh, ultimate load uh, of 10 mega newtons with a factor of resistance of just over six mega newtons. And at that amount of load, we're predicting a deflection or settlement of uh, 12 millimeters. And the service load, again, it's about 35% of that, which is more likely where the pile will, that's the type of load it will generally see. It's only going to be seeing about four and a half mega newtons. And at that level, uh, at that stress level, it's going to see, you're going to see about six millimeters of settlement. So uh, just some of the highlights uh, to summarize things. Uh, shaft friction was mobilized with, uh, with very little movement. It's somewhere in the order of five to 10 millimeters. Uh, mobilization of end bearing, however, on the other hand, took an awful lot as you, were, as you could see in the, in the plots and it's typically in excess of 10% of the bell diameter. Uh, for the for the belt pile at uh, at sort of design conditions, which is somewhere in the order of seventy millimeters, you were seeing about seventy percent of the load was being carried by the shaft and thirty percent uh, by the tip, and in the rock socket at uh, SLS conditions, you were probably seeing ninety percent of the shaft. So really, the shaft is doing the bulk of the work in in most piles. Uh, at least these these particular concrete pipes, for sure. So just a, a quick discussion on some of the end bearing uh, for the clay till. Uh, we did a number of laboratory UU tests and the shear strength uh, from those UU tests close to where the uh, belt pile was, was installed. We were seeing a, a, a shear strength of about 145 kPa using an NT value that works out to an ultimate end bearing of 1300. And that agreed really well with the load test uh, results that we saw. And we never, we, we ran out of stroke capacity in the jack and probably would have got to 13 or higher if we had, had more ability to, or room in the, uh, in, in the test pile itself. Uh, Canadian Foundation Engineering Manual uh, for uh, for large diameter piles typically recommends an NT of six, but we were able to demonstrate for this site anyway, that we were able to get a, a higher value uh, of NT. Uh, something we had done is uh, the end bearing from the rock socket. Originally we were estimating about a five MPA, but from the load test, we were able to demonstrate that we were able to actually get closer to six, which is 20% higher than originally estimated. So. And that's one of the things about the load test that's advantageous. Not only do you get a 50% increase on your design uh, values, but you also get the benefit of if I achieve much higher end bearing or shaft friction values, you can, you can incorporate that information as well. So again, that just makes it a more economical or at the end of the day, really uh, a more cost-effective foundation. So in summary, um, the belt pile uh, load test allowed us uh, to confirm an NT of nine for when you're doing design for belt piles in clay tail, which again, as I mentioned earlier on, is a very common foundation type. Our rock socket end bearing was certainly higher than, it was about 20% higher than what we'd originally estimated from our analysis. Uh, and again, the big value, the big advantage with, with having instrumentation is that you can actually physically measure the shaft friction and the end bearing. A lot of times people will do uninstrumented test. And if I get an increase, you know, if I'm estimating a capacity of let's say five mega newtons, but I actually get six, well, the question is, was that coming from the shaft? Was it coming from the end bearing? Which part of the shaft was it coming from? It, it doesn't allow you to answer all those questions. So something you really want to push for if you ever get into is making sure that your, your test pile is, uh, is instrumented. Uh, and the designers, as I mentioned earlier, have were able to use the higher shaft for the soil resistance factor 0.6. So it resulted in most cost-effective uh, foundation system for the project or for the contractor in this instance. Something else that we've been able to utilize is taking that information, again, the belt piles, for instance, 
and the rock sockets are actually very common foundation types that are used. Uh, but we were able to back analyze uh, using finite element uh, the information from the load test and then take that information. Uh, you know, blow counts of in the order of somewhere in the order of 20 to 25 is pretty typical for our tills. And uh, we've had situations where clients have come to us after the fact and said, well, look, we've got belt piles here and this is, uh, we want to increase the design load on these piles by 10%. So uh, how are they going to, how are they going to behave, right? And uh, we've been able to utilize this kind of information uh, and, and be able to provide a more accurate prediction for what we'd expect for, uh, for deformations and settlements with the, uh, in those kinds of situations. And if everyone's interested, this paper was originally presented at the 64th Canadian Geotechnical Conference back in 2011. Um, just a quick uh, review, if you remember this test, um, three quarters of the way through the load test, the tent blew away which is not anything that you ever really plan on, nor do you want it to happen, okay? So, you know, lesson learned, make sure you really nail down the tent. We had a, a huge gust of wind, just a windstorm come up. And fortunately, we were most of the way through the test, but this is how we finished up the test. So it was pitch black, it was in December. So you can imagine it wasn't exactly warm, but surprisingly, all the equipment still functioned. And we were able to uh, to finish the load test, and you can see here there's a there's an opening right there, and there's about an inch of movement there where the concrete is actually moved away from the ground surface. So anyway, that finishes my presentation. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to have the, the question session. So I don't know if someone here in the room has any question right now, or we can begin with the one thing. Okay. May? Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just have a question about the logistics of when the testing was completed relative to construction. I would, I would and yeah it's it's a lot of times if you know you're going with that particular foundation type and that's that's an excellent question because you're right uh, in this instance we had to fully mobilize all the equipment and when it was done we had to demobilize it um if you, you know you're going with that particular foundation system and you have the ability to sort of tweak your design, then you can do it immediately prior. But typically what happens is um, you install the test pile and you typically have to wait at least a week for the concrete to set. Because uh, if you don't, it's going to fail and you'll end up with the picture you see on your screen right now because that's what happened. Uh, in that case, that was just a conventional load test, but the pile actually physically broke and it tipped over. And by the way, you don't ever want to have that happen on your site because it's no fun. Um, but in, if, if you have the ability to tweak your design, you can do it immediately before, but the concrete, typically your, your the production equipment will sit for a week or two while you have, wait for the concrete to set, you have to, uh, then run the load test and you have to do the analysis and then come back and then they can tweak their design even further. And that's the best way, but that's really cutting it close. Uh, so that does happen on occasion. We've also had instances where we've done a load test and the contractor just goes straight into production. He said, we're going to be conservative with first piles, but so it, there's a couple different ways of approaching it. And it all depends on a lot of it is schedule driven, right? So schedule in a lot of cases and but again you can save the cost of the mob and demo if you can keep the production equipment on site and you're ready to roll right away so uh question from the zoom uh what if there are doubts about the integrity the quality of the concrete cover concrete between the dance rebar cage and the pipe perimeter Assessing the, the shallow resistance, can you get any warning signs when conducting the fire test? 
Uh, no, in, in, in this particular instance, and especially with typical board piles, you have, uh, you're physically able to see down the hole, which is really good. Uh, and you can actually confirm that you've got, uh, you know, a, a good pile shape and shaft. Uh, uh, the strain gauges you have, you, when you're doing your analysis, you're making the assumption that you have a specific area because if it's, if it's larger or it's narrower, that actually affects the calculations. So you are making some assumptions. Um, commonly what is done is you also, you can also do what we call a pile integrity test. I don't know if that was covered in any of your coursework or not, but uh, you do a PIT test on the pile and that gives you an idea of what the shaft shape looks like. Uh, does if you're doing it on a belt pile, it doesn't pick up the bell very well. It just gets the, the, the signal gets too uh, too confusing. But normally you would just use a PIT to, to check your uh, your concrete cover or doesn't actually give you the cover, it gives you the actual shape of the the, the, the diameter of the pile itself. Hey, Daniel, I'll uh, just call in here. I'll ask one. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has, has questions in the room, but I just have a couple for you, Tony. Um, so considering that uh, a lot of consultants are still doing, uh, they're still uh, electing to do non-instrumented kind of proof tests um, with no strain gauges, um, do you think that there's, uh, that, the CA, that the CFEM should be separating? The geotechnical resistance factors for instrumented tests and non-instrumented tests. Just considering that, obviously, if you're instrumenting a shaft or instrumenting a pile, you have a much higher degree of certainty. Yeah, I, I think the big advantage in instrumentation with an instrumented test is um, it gives the designer a lot more confidence. You know, I. I you know, you, you do the load test and you say, oh, wow, I, I've got 20% more on here than I expected. So I know that I've got more shaft resistance and or end bearing. And the problem is with, with the test that isn't instrumented, you're, you're kind of hampered uh, in terms of knowing exactly, well, am I getting more out of my shaft? Am I getting more out of my, my end bearing? Or where's that coming from? So you, you don't know it. And, and I guess if push came to shove, I'd say I'd probably lean towards, uh, yeah, I, I would think that I'd have more, I always, you obviously have way more confidence if you've got instrumentation, absolutely, right? And and I, I think I would, I'd support the case for uh, an instrument to test uh, being able to use uh, higher resistance factors than, uh, than a non-instrument to test, so. Okay, thanks, Tony. Uh, just one quick question. Do you know, when they did the analysis, do you know if they were assuming a, a, a constant modulus for the concrete, or did they assume that it changes with load? I'm assuming it was constant. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. and again, we weren't doing it, load the load test people themselves. So yeah. uh, we actually hired the company called Load Test. I think they've been taken over and now called Fugro, if I'm not mistaken, Fugro Load Test. Um, so they did all the data analysis. We weren't involved in any of that at all. Okay, great. Thanks, Tony. Right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Tony. My name is Lee Jim. I'm the geotechnical faculty here. Um, yeah, we teach um, we, we teach our grad students about loading tests and then the interpretation of loading tests. There's a lot of common languages, as so you can see, by right? the you know the you know low factors 0.4 versus 0.6, right? So it's very important to see that our you know our language is the same in harmony, right? Um, have some questions about that, right? Do you see people, right? This is, for this large, you know, very large long piles, right? Do you see people, you know, carry the conventional top down or loading test with uh, maybe a few thousand kilometers or a few hundred meters, right? Um, you know, from the from the you know cost wise, right? Which one is more advantages, right? You know, so you know uh, the the OCL versus conventional you know, top-down loading test. And then the other question I you know, looking at the pictures, right, it looks like those piles, right, the tested piles, are these the same as you know, the, uh, the production part? I don't see the cages, right? I don't see the ladder, right? I'm not sure what's a reinforcement, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, when you think about it, um, I'll start with your second question. Uh, the, the rebar itself is typically used primarily for either handling lateral load or for handling uplift, okay? Uh, in pure compression, the steel is really not doing much of anything, okay? So, uh, you know, again, we, we could put rebar cages in, but all that does is it stiffens up the pile. You'd actually get probably a, a more favorable response. So doing it without the steel significantly reduces the cost because to put in a cage in that might be 10,000 bucks. Like they're not cheap for sure, right? In a lot of cases, the structural engineers will put in full length cages into their piles. And that's one of my personal pet peeves is that, you know, you really don't need it. Because again, uh, lateral load is, is typically the, the big reason that they need reinforcing steel. Okay. And um, if, if, you, if you don't have any lateral load, really, it's if all the loads purely, you know, vertical, right. And, and in most piles, it's compression, they a lot of, you know, you typically any typical pile inside this building, for instance, probably will never see any lateral load, nor will it see any uplift, load, right? It'll only see compression, and that's it. So, I mean, from a purely theoretical perspective, you likely don't even need any steel in that at all. Uh, you never do that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating that at all. But uh, a lot of cases, we have 20, 25 meter long piles, and they're full length steel. And I always ask the structurals, why are you making this full length? You could probably put in a, a nine or 10 meter long cage because all your lateral load is typically taken up in the top top eight, eight pile diameters. Once you get below that, you don't have any lateral load in that pile whatsoever, right? And again, if you don't have, uh, and again, even to, to even for uplift resistance, uh, if, if you've got if you got significant uplift resistance, then you want to have a cage or or a dewy egg bar, for instance, all going all the way to the bottom so you can mobilize it. So, and sorry, the first part of your question was the cost. oh the cost. Yes, um, we found that in a lot of cases um, the the piles that we typically and this is an example of just a conventional load test, which we've done a lot of. Uh, the O cell is a bit of an oddity. It doesn't happen very often. And again, the, the, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but the reason for, for, the, for the O cell is, is if you get up to really big loads, you get up to 20, 30, 40, 50 mega newtons, you can't, the size of reaction beam that you need and the number of anchor piles, it gets really cost prohibitive. So our, our typical load on a, on a load test locally here is kind of in the five mega newton range. And that you can put in, uh, and typically you would see for, for a typical load test around the city here, and we've done about 100 or so in the last 10 or 12 years, uh, you typically just use a, a conventional load test, similar to what you see in the picture here. You wouldn't use an O-cell. So the reason to go to the O-cell is, is, is big loads, right? So um, yeah, the biggest, the biggest vertical load test I've applied using conventional is about 18 mega newtons. And they're typically in the five mega newton range is, is uh, and again, you tend uh, locally in the market. Uh, CFA piles, have you guys touched on those at all? Did you, I don't know if you discussed them. Yeah, there, we can still get some pretty good loads on those. Uh, so we typically, most of our load testing that we've done in the past you know, decade or so, has been on CFA piles in particular. Um, and, uh, but they are very cost effective. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's probably the, 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 the pile methodology and installation of choice uh, in the local market now, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. We have the time for just one last question. Okay. So we are going to go with one of the questions in the, of the people. Can you sort out how much shaft resistance comes from each stratigraphic unit about the cell? Uh, again, the, the, the information on the shaft friction doesn't come from the cell, it comes from the strain gauges. Okay, so the, the, 
the thing to, to keep in mind is as you're as as the ocel it's basically it's a jack and it's just pushing up right so it's opening up and it's it's pushing the pile up and it's pushing it down so you're you're generating resistance below the 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 lower plate and and above the upper plate right so as as the con as the pile moves you start mobilizing the shaft resistance so you're actually developing that shaft friction and that's picked up in the strain gauges so the strain gauges give us the information on the on the shaft resistance okay okay uh, i guess that's all the questions for for today because we we are running out of time okay uh so thank you very much for the presentation and thank you all for the this great uh, seminar for coming for our seminar please the graduate students uh, stay after the conference for the information about the, the training world competition okay thank you very much